Welcome back. This is our final episode of our Headspace series with Senda and Phil. A few quick things to hype, as always. The first thing that we want to talk about is that September is International Podcast Month. What is International Podcast Month? It is a wonderful opportunity for all of us podcasters to cross-promote, celebrate each other, and share the love of podcasting with the world. To celebrate, a collaboration of diverse and inclusive podcasting folks have recorded RPG one-shots and audio drama minisodes and have contributed to a month-long blog. And I am going to be participating in this event in force. I pretty much did everything that you could do in this event, so keep an eye out pretty much the entire month. <laughs> at, the be- <laughs> at the beginning of the month, you can catch the game that I played with Victoria Rogers from the Broadstords at the helm. Also, I have a small guest spot on the Interference audio drama mini episode. Then at the very end of the month, you can catch me running my All Out of Bubblegum hack, All Out of Elder Signs. And finally, I created an audio drama episode myself. It is a precursor to a brand new podcast that I will be developing within the next year or so called Side Heroes. And throughout the month, you will be able to catch up on a couple articles that I wrote for the event. And needless to say, I did uh, quite a lot for this thing because Tess is the best. We also wanted to let you know that Domina Magica, which we discussed in our episode with Jim McClure, is now on Kickstarter. It has already funded and met several of its stretch goals. Mm. So if playing a game about magical girls sounds like your jam, oh yeah, right? If you are Ryan, we will put a <laughs> link to the Kickstarter in our show notes and you can head over there. And as usual, we do have our Discord server still going strong. So feel free to join us at discord.charactercreationcast.com and join the discussion. You can also support us on the One Shot Network Patreon page at patreon.com slash one shot podcast. You can catch our first bonus episode that features me talking with my newly appointed best friend Jude about our experiences at Gen Con. And another great way to support us is to write a review on Apple Podcasts or the podcast review service of your choice. We definitely appreciate more of them. This one comes in from Dungeons and Dumbbells, uh, which is Cameron from Sounds Like Crows. And it is titled, Oh Me, Oh My. And there's a lot of caps locks in this one. You have so to I read it like excited. super enthusiastically. I will try my best. Are you ready for Amelia and Ryan's gentle voices to kick you in the head with interesting and new character creation concepts from equally interesting people around the tabletop RPG community? Huh, okay, I'll That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> then you, my friend, have come to the right podcast. These two are absolute gems, and they do an amazing job highlighting the pros and cons of various tabletop RPG systems and how to build characters. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you, Cameron. That was... I that was a that was a very good review. A plus. I give that review five stars. With all of that, thank you for bearing with us this week. Here is your episode. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of operators for Headspace. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Senda and Phil of Pandas Talking Games, among other things. And we will start with Phil this time. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself again, Phil, for everybody at home? And tell us a bit about the character that you made in our last episodes. Uh, Sure, I'm Phil Vecchion, um, writer, podcaster, game designer, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) (laughs) That doesn't help anybody find anything. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I'm DNA Phil on Twitter, and I have a couple podcasts on Mr. Mark and uh, work for... uh, and I'm a partner at Encoded Designs. So <laughs> last time, the character I made for Headspace was the Runner. His name was Charger. He was a neon and had some uh, had some kind of cool stuff. Had a vehicle link and uh, 
some other goodies and was responsible for driving the contagion into the what is now quarantine zone after uh, the tsunami. So kind of racked with guilt for his part in infecting all these people. And Senda, do you want to introduce yourself again and tell us about the character you made? Yeah, I'm so I'm Senda and I do Pandas Talking Games with Phil and I also do She's a Super Geek with my other co-host who has been on the show before and I also write for Gnomes too. I guess we'll say that and you should all look up my game Love and Justice because it's super cool. And I was playing uh, the White Coat whose name was Angel and I'm also a Neon and I have cool snakeskin patterned skin and a glowing um, like floating white light emitting hair. So that's me. I run a cramped and impoverished but essential clinic on the streets where I'm basically trying to develop the cure for this disease that's spreading, but I am working for redemption because I created this disease. Amelia, can you tell us a bit about your character? Sure. Um, So my character was Kurosawa, which is the Ronin. So I know I was responsible for helping to destroy some of the infrastructure of the city that made the emergency response a lot more difficult after the tsunami and sort of aided in the outbreak becoming more of an epidemic pandemic level situation. I feel like that's most of it. What did you look like? Oh, yeah. I guess that's important. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> we all looked really, really cool. We did. Yeah, we did. I, well, I looked less cool than you guys because I went with Drifter. And so I had pretty threadbare clothes, kind of frizzy hair, and an eye patch. Nice. Yeah. And what about you, Ryan? I went with the tech, and his name is Flynn. He was from the corporate subculture, and uh, he likes to wear overly expensive clothing just because he, he likes to look good while he is doing his tech stuff. And he's actually the one that designed the release mechanism for the contagion for the corporation that he was working for prior to going rogue. And he is uh, wanting to figure out a way to create a mechanism to release a cure once we can find it or recreate it. Recreate, yeah. Yeah. Because everything went very, very wrong when we tried to get it back. (laughs) Yes. Just a little bit. Yeah, we lost uh, we lost two people from our team. Was yep. that Razor and Washington? Mm-hmm. Oh, Washington! Oh, R.I.P. Washington. Washington. <laughs> you were too good for us. <laughs> he, he was too good for us. Oh, we didn't deserve Man, you. What what a terrible <laughs> way to go, too. Oh. Yeah, seriously. Oh gosh. <sighs> All right. Well, how about we go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D twenty for your thought. D twenty for your thoughts. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it feels in this system compared to others. But first, we'd like to ask how each of you got into role-playing games for the first time. So how about we start with (laughs) Phil? I am uh, old, so uh, (laughs) I am a product of the 1980s explosion of D&D. I was... uh, In elementary school, when uh, my neighbor and his buddies were uh, playing D&D, of which I think they were playing D1, Descent into the Depths of the Earth, and I saw the dice and the maps and just all of them sitting around the table talking, and I was immediately hooked. And I wound up being in a separate game because those were older kids, and they weren't going to take any younger kids to to play D D, so i i got my neighbor to uh, run stuff for me and uh so i yeah i played you know first edition D D, and then pretty much just kept playing without much of a break since 1982 oh wow because so, i'm old as long as i have been alive <laughs> yes exactly yeah you're old <laughs> longer than i've been alive <laughs> uh, two Man years Phil. old at that point so <laughs> all right how about yourself senda um okay well i i told the long version of this story actually on i am here mm-hmm. um tessa's new podcast which is fantastic oh, so, so I, I will tell the story in brief <laughs> yeah because <laughs> um, it could take me a while so like i had i basically had like these two 
Ah, no, skip that part. Okay. I was going to say, do you have, like, the two phases of, like, the when I was younger and then after I had kids? <laughs> well, I do kind of have that, but <laughs> that's different. <laughs> so, so basically what happened is uh, I was super into reading fantasy books and stuff, and I, I read like as many Dragonlance books as I could get my hands on. I had no idea that it was related to a game. And then, of course, I was like off prowling because let's be honest, every time you hit one of those giant Chronicles games where there's like so many different authors involved, like some of the books are like really good and some of them are like, eh. Yeah. And so I was always like hunting down more books by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, of course, because the <laughs> the really good ones, right? So I uh, stumbled across the the Dark Sword trilogy, which was a trilogy, of course. And I read them. And it's like this cool, like, they have laser swords, but they, like, punch needles into your hand to, like, suck energy out of you. I don't know. It's been years since I've read them. But I was super into it. And one day I'm at a used bookstore. Or maybe it was a library book sale or something. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> um, but I picked up this book. Like, I'm, I'm going through the fantasy section. I'm like, oh, this is a Dark Sword book. Like, it's got... It's got the name, like the the logo on it and everything. And I'm like, I've never heard of this book. And like, it's not part of the trilogy. And like, what is it? And I pick it up and, and I buy it, of course. And then I take it home. And what I didn't know at the time and didn't really figure out for a while was, and, and I can't quite remember, and I'm not sure that I still have it even, um, but it was either the setting book or the rules for the Dark Sword system. But I don't think there was really a system. So it was much more like, here's a setting book and here here's how you run games in this world. <laughs> but I didn't know what an RPG was. <laughs> so I was like designing cities and like storylines in notebooks and being like, I don't really understand how all of this works. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and, and that happened in like, I don't know, middle school. And then I got to college. So many years passed because my friends were not as nerdy as me. And I got to college and I was living on the honors floor. And one day one of my friends came by and was like, Hey, we're going to play D and D. And it was like right after third edition came out, but like, we're going to, we're going to run a game of D and D. And I was like, okay, like, how does that work? And he was like, you get to play characters in a fantasy thing. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so like only later after I had played for a while, did I look back in retrospect and go, that was a setting book that I picked up. I get it. <laughs> now I understand. But so that's how it started was basically once I finally found a group of nerds, it sort of evolved naturally into playing third edition D&D &D, and from there I went to three to three five and I got to whine about how all my weapons got smaller because of course I was playing a kender so that's halfling but you know <laughs> etc you are like the stuff. one person that that chapter in the front of every RPG book is for what is a role-playing right? game except it wasn't in the front of that book <laughs> oh no the one time that we really right. could have used it <laughs> Right. So like that thing where people are like, I'm not going to put that chapter in. I'm like, that's great. Except you really don't know who's going to pick up your book. Exactly. Right? I know. I just always <laughs> wish that they were like, I don't know that there was like a way to make them interesting for people who are like, I know what this is. You know what right. I mean? Well, like I, was, I mean, I'm always like, oh, we'll just can, skip that part. But <laughs> if you can keep them short and succinct and make it easy for people who do know what it is to just get past it. Like, then I think it's okay. And I also totally understand, like, not putting it in these days. It's like, I don't have a problem with that. But it is really funny because I am that person who had this book and I was like, I literally don't understand what's happening, but I'm going to try and use it anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel like that's how a lot of people start out, though. They're like, oh, I ended up with this book and I, I didn't know what to do with it. But there's a lot of stories about that kind of thing. <laughs> Actually, yeah. like a lot of people stumbling across basically setting books. And like you can see that there are rules and that there should be rules. But like the reason I'm pretty sure it was a setting book is I don't remember any mention of dice or anything whatsoever. Like, huh. <laughs> so <laughs> it must have been created to run in some i mean some version of like a basic D, &D system i mean it was a it's a pretty fantasy world so i don't know yeah so yeah. you're trying Someday, to like do that backwards equation of like what right, is this like, for <laughs> right i'm gonna try and recreate like i understand that there's a game like a, a game master and i understand that there are players and that you tell a story together but like then from there like i didn't have any concept of how you like would work with like i didn't have the actual rules how do you do that collaboratively <laughs> i don't like just hang well, out like, or like are there like i didn't know that there were dice involved like, right you know. 
Interesting. So that's so weird. Interesting. Yeah, that was my so that was my first experience. And then from there, we went to you know actually playing, and I played that first campaign that I played for like a year and a half, and I was a college student, so we literally played it for like eight hours at a time and we went after anime clubs we went to anime club from seven to ten on fridays then we went back to the dorms and we played D from 10 until whenever the red bull wore off of our dm and nobody could afford to buy him a new one like sometimes the sun came up <laughs> those were the days <laughs> yeah. those Co- were the days <laughs> college was phenomenal for role playing i didn't yeah. role play in college like i'm so sorry i did a little yeah. bit in high school and it was like kind of a not super great experience and then i didn't start again until like two or three years ago yeah welcome back i'm glad yes. you're here mm-hmm. i'm glad to be here <laughs> i am also glad you're here yeah i got tired of being left out because my my ex would go you know go off and have his game night and i was like i feel like i miss role-playing games like i remember liking the concept of it and then i was like you have to take me and so i kept like baking cupcakes and stuff until they all agreed to let me come <laughs> and they were like fine as long as you bring Bribery. stuff and i was like yes and then now we're here. And I was like, now we're here where you, you, you're you like, no, I'm sorry. This is actually my hobby. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. When you guys make characters for any game, um, not necessarily for Headspace, do you have a particular process or a particular way of doing things? Or do you kind of just do what feels right? I mean, I personally, I, I know that I do a lot of kind of what feels right. But the, the key thing for me I mean, I'll I'll pick all sorts of different things across a big, wide spectrum of people because it's fun to play people and types of people and experiences and stuff that I haven't played before. Like that's that's cool to me, and I'm I'm just in that space. There was a long time where I was like, well, I just play rogues, so I will take the most roguish thing you have, and and you know I moved past that. <laughs> the key thing to me is actually um, having a good feel of what like my motivation is for like, why am I here? Why am I in this story? And secondarily having a good relationship with at least one of the other characters at the table. And those are the two best predictors for me of if I'm going to like the character and if I'm going to enjoy the game are having um, a motivating factor, which doesn't have to like, it can be a conflicting thing and that's awesome. Like, I, I like doing things the hard way. That's part of how I game and and having that relationship. Yeah. So if the game doesn't build that in for me, then that's something that I have to put in a little bit more work into doing for myself. Right. Totally. But it's worth it. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about oh, yeah. you, Phil? I think mostly for me, it's it's first understanding what the core loop of the game is about. So what is the actual thing that you do session to session in this game. Then I look for like then I look at the characters in terms of well how do they how do they contribute to that core loop. So, you know, if our game, you know, in in this case like for Headspace like, you know, this is a cyberpunk game, so doing jobs is a uh doing jobs is a big component, so you know, part of that kind of thinking through it is, well, you know, how does the runner fit in with doing jobs, right? And so then, you know, well, that's, you know, transport in, transport out mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so then that gives me like kind of the hook for, okay, I think I can play this character because I kind of understand what my purpose is in in the, you know, in the whole of the game. And if I can't figure out that core loop, then I have um, a lot harder time picking out characters so then i default to barbarian so, um, if, if, if you catch me in a situation where i just have to pick something and i don't have any concepts then i still pick rogue like it's just a thing yeah i wind up picking something tanky and smashy yeah yeah you know? that's that's how we ended up with smash man and skill monkey mm-hmm. <laughs> hey you know you, you do what works when you when you're not sure about the rest of it you you kind of stay in that comfort zone which i i like when games have that sort of a more defined, like, here is what a character is going to do in this game. Or if the game itself doesn't have that, to have a really solid session zero where you can sit down with the GM and say, okay, what are we doing in this game? Because I think there's nothing worse than coming into a game and having this really cool character concept and then having nothing for that character to do. Because I mm-hmm. think it, probably most of us have been in a situation where like, like that where you've you've got this really great idea and, like, no opportunity to use any of those cool hooks that you've put in place and it's such a bummer 
Yeah. Yes. I mean, actually, I mean, I actually kind of work to avoid that. Like I've, I've had so many problems with players coming in with preconceived notions of characters that they wanted, then those notions not fitting into the scope of the game that I never come in. I never come in with an idea. I come in with, I could basically come in blank and I'm like, cool. okay, let me see what this game's supposed to do, what it's about, and I'll start from there. But yeah, I've just seen so many times where people are like, I'm going to make this great pyromancer and I'm going to do all this cool, you know, flame stuff or whatever. And then only to find out the campaign is like set in a water world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Under, <laughs> right? Underwater. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's set underwater, right? And the pyromancer is like screwed from like, you know, the moment the campaign starts. So yeah, I really, um, I really strive to kind of come in empty more just basically like okay i'm committing to playing this game i think this game is cool all right let's see what you know if the designers have done their job these characters all do something to support uh whatever that core loop of the game is so i just need to see which one of those support things is you know jives with me the most yeah that's a good healthy detachment to it though (laughs) i feel like i (laughs) So I have a hard time with that, though, just because I'm a terrible decision maker. And so when I go into those situations, especially when you have a session zero and you do character creation together as a group, I'm always the one that's holding things up because I haven't made a decision yet. And then you've put these like things in front of me and I'm like, oh, I don't know. What am I going to do? I have no ideas. I don't like I get I have to come in with like something. (laughs) I think you can look in advance. Like if I know I'm going to go play like like if I know I'm going to go to a game of Monster Hearts. Like, I will go and look through the playbooks for Monster Hearts. I just won't commit to one because if I come in and somebody's like, oh, I totally want to be the vampire. And all I thought about was being the vampire. Like, You're gonna have a bad then time. I'm back to square one. <laughs> yeah. But if I went through it and I was like, oh, the vampire's cool, but so is this one and so is that one. Mm-hmm. Then, like, when we get to the table and somebody's like, oh, my God, I like the vampire's totally calling to me. I can be like, cool. All right. Yeah. You know, I... I got a couple other choices kind of thing. Oh, yeah. I I mean, I can't go to a restaurant without checking a menu before. Yeah, there's a happy medium in there somewhere between, like, having no prep and no, you know, and then coming in with, like, I have 12 pages of backstory that I wrote. Like, would you like to see my novella? Right. (laughs) Because, like Senda said, too, when it's a lot of fun to kind of hook player characters together, too, and have those relationships, too. So if you come in with this really strong concept that even if it does fit with the story, like doesn't fit with what anybody else is doing too, then that's kind of a bummer. And I think that you develop cooler backstories and stuff too when you work with people. I, I pretty much never let my players develop their characters away from the table. If we're going to make characters, we're all making them at the table together. Like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't do the thing where it's like, you know, show up with your character because it's six snowflakes show back up and they're, you know, all of them are super special and different and don't interlock and have connections to each other. And then I'm just spending a whole bunch of time, like trying to make connections between them as opposed to, okay, we're all sitting down at the table. We're playing a superhero team, figure it out. Which one of you is, which one you use the difficult one, which one to use the wisecracker. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. yeah. It ends up being a series of vignettes instead of like a solid story. Yep. That And that's something fairly new to me because in the games I played previously up until like the last year or so, we always just did it separately. It was like mm-hmm. show up, like here's roughly kind of what I think we're going to do in this game and uh, I don't know, bring a character. Session one is this day. And it was like oh, okay. And then you get there and nothing goes together and it's no good. Yeah, I, I like. I honestly it. can't think of a Palladium Heroes Unlimited game that my <laughs> friends and I have played where we didn't do it that way where we all created our own cool characters and it was up to the game master to get us all together in session one and sometimes it was messy a lot of times it was messy because it was like okay why should our characters care about each other when we never knew each other beforehand in the defense of palladium Making your character away from the table is good because, I mean, eight to ten hours of character generation is just not sustainable when you have a group of people trying to share one book. Like, no, no, go off and make your Heroes Unlimited character. Yep. I'll see you next week. Because you want to still have friends to play the game mm-hmm. with eventually. Right. And if you're doing it together, uh, it seems like you might not be friends anymore. Yeah. Heroes I... Unlimited and Ninjas and Super Spies. Oh, that was the other yes. one where character creation was like a six-hour ordeal and you combine them and it's even worse (laughs) (laughs) like my friends and i did 
next episode no, on I, Creation we, Cast. So <laughs> many. Yeah, Amelia has so no many idea what she's into because we're we're planning to cover it sometime. Because that's my passion game. Oh, I'll do t- I'll do TMNT like that. Oh, um... that, that, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's a fun one. <laughs> I don't know. So I have to I'm jump into this point. PBTA games. Yeah, I'm a fan of PBTA <laughs> and also like Session Zero. The game that I'm playing right now is a police procedural and it's Savage Worlds. Like there's no official like thing with that. But like Session Zeros are kind of my favorite. So whether the game builds mm-hmm. it in or not, I kind of love them. They're super fun because as you start figuring out how you're all connected, like everything gets better and better and i feel like it ratchets up the stakes for Mm -hmm. all of the situations higher and i like high stakes in my games because i like feels yeah i'd rather be more connected to the other players at the table Mm -hmm. than the npcs that i've shoehorned into my backstory yeah and i'm gonna also say that it probably has something to do with my personal gming style which is if you hand me 12 pages of backstory i'm not gonna read it like (laughs) (laughs) sorry i don't have time like four sentences, yes. A page, maybe <laughs> if it's really compelling. Right, like eh, that's a lot of work for me you to ask me to do, which is really funny because I know that at least one of the gals that I play with, like she does that level of backstory constantly, but she very much adheres to the theory that I think both Phil and I adhere to, which is that if it hasn't happened and come up at the table, it doesn't actually exist. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be to be clear. A player can write 12 pages of backstory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm only going to read about four sentences. Yes. <laughs> so, like, if, if 12 pages is what gets you to the table and feeling comfortable about your character, mm-hmm. go ahead and write it. But expectation-wise, just give me, like, four bullet points about this character, mm-hmm. and I'll and, and then the rest will do through play. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, and I definitely think that, like, I, there have been times where I have, have spent time writing out a backstory and stuff, again, with the understanding that, like, it, it may end up changing through play or something like that. But it, it does sometimes help you kind of embody the character a little bit when you're playing to have a really good idea of like who they are and you Mm -hmm. know so i think that's something that like if you want to do there's certainly value in that don't expect everyone to come along for the ride with you if you want to put in (laughs) that work that's fine but don't put that on me (laughs) but i i think session zero has a lot of value in that way and like the way that we build characters and you know obviously i mean that's essentially what this show is is like a, a really prolonged session zero yeah, for session every zero. single mm-hmm. game <laughs> yeah exactly which is great that's which why it's cool yeah yeah and that kind of leads us into the next question um headspace is you know uh, like all the a lot of the other pbta games your session zero is part of the game yeah because you have to create your characters as a group because it has all the questions that link everybody together um so how do we think the character creation for headspace stacks up to other systems that we've played before not necessarily other pbta games i mean i i always like systems that create relationships with characters from the get-go and powered by the apocalypse in general tends to be really good at that it's not the only game that does it but it's one of its strong points in terms of character creation as as a whole i think Mm -hmm. the the thing that i think makes headspace really different from that is that you're not only involved in in creating Session Zero style backstory when you're doing relationships, you are also involved in Session Zero style backstory when you are putting your stats in. Like that that is the yeah. thing about this game that I think is unbelievably unique that I, I really like. <laughs> um because it, it basically <laughs> By the time you get to the point where you're answering questions about each other, you're also relating emotions to each other. And then you are tying that directly into the mechanics that you're going to use for the rest of the game. So it is connected. It it all connects in really, really well. It's it's really tight. It's really tight. Mark did a really great job with it. Mm -hmm. Um, In that it's it's inevitable that you're going to get these close relationships because it would be really hard to do character creation without doing that like it is built to drive you in that direction right Mm -hmm. i've never done a character creation in this game that that didn't have um you know some pretty intense elements and i know like the first time i played this game when when mark ran it for me at gen con like 2014 
14, 15, I don't know. I don't remember. Like we sat down and we didn't really play much out. Like we played for like half an hour outside of the character creation because it was just two hours we'd like carved out. Mm -hmm. Um, But the character creation was so phenomenal. Like I didn't care. Like it's such a major part of the game. It stands very well on its own as the first session of a game. Right. Yeah. And it feels like a like a mini RPG in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to create the story as if you had actually played out the missions that you're describing all of this stuff happening. Right. And especially in that you're going to have a ghost, right? Like that there's probably yeah. someone who died. Like it is also immediate stakes raising and, and impetus for creating these stories where something bad must mm-hmm. have happened. I, I wasn't prepared for that. I mean, I was in a, in a way I knew it was something that happened. I wasn't prepared for the raw emotion that was brought about because of this sort of process like when we got to washington and the way he had passed like okay we had an idea and then we built on that and then we had the final idea and i was like wow yeah it it, it gets heavy <laughs> yeah, yeah it's really emotional yeah and i i love that that it's yeah it has like that immersive quality right as you're going through character creation like you're already in the story yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think I've uh, played a game that has had that sort of emotional investment before you even start playing. Um, I, I mean, I think that it leaves you in a very good place to start off immediately. And sometimes starting off immediately, like when I when I run this, sometimes it literally means that you just start from the place where like the backstory ended. So it's like if I were going to run this game, it would be perfectly reasonable of me to be like, well, I could start in the future as you guys try to do something and I'll make something up. Or I can just say, all right, you're all in the getaway car. Tell me how you get out of here, right? Mm-hmm. Like as you're being chased all over the place and stuff. I'm, <laughs> so it's it's perfectly possible to also literally just start because you, you basically build up to the high point in a story and then you can you can play through how you got out of the rest of that situation. We know it was bad. So that's an adventure in and of itself. Or you can you you can be like, okay, we got away, and then you can say, okay, you know, now here's the next heist, right? The next right. job. They're both very effective. But it gives you a lot of impetus to kind of act as your character because you already have a very good idea of who they are, what their life has been like, and this terrible thing that they did, right? And (laughs) why they are now acting to try to make the world better because everything is horrible because partially at least because of this thing that they did, right? Mm -hmm. Or this thing that they didn't stop, depending on how you um, set it up. But then also now you're linked to all of these other people and you have this even more emotional drive that's a little bit closer because... You know, you just lost someone. Yeah. Like, raise the stakes. Here's a here's a character. Get attached to them. Now, what happened to them? Like, why aren't mm-hmm. they here anymore? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've kind of answered our next question a little bit, but we usually like to talk about how the mechanics of character creation reinforce the feel of the game once you start playing. And we've covered it a little bit, but I, I think we can kind of expand on it that like the relationships between characters are really important. The backstory is really important. Those kinds of things seem to be central to creating the characters, but also to playing the game. I mean, I haven't played this game necessarily, so I don't, I can't say for sure, but you should play it sometime. I want to (laughs) call me. (laughs) Phil, I've been talking a lot. You want to talk about this part? Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I think some of the interesting things of the way the mechanics tie in, besides just the backstory stuff, is since you have to pick an emotion that goes with every one of your skills and and, and the leading questions that kind of tie to them, like you wind up not only defining your skills, but you kind of define these events that kind of surround them and why, you know, why does fear, why does rage, you know, govern pilot and why does, you know, ego govern parkour and so it's it's even more um it's even more reinforcing in that respect so i think it does a really good job of kind of pulling all of that stuff together i I would say is my only critique which i don't know if it comes out in play is the subcultures like nothing about the subculture really links to anything else like you pick one for looks Mm -hmm. but like I've, I, it was the one piece of the game that, like, as we went through, I'm like, the subcultures are really cool, but 
Like I would have dug it if like you got a move or something. Like if it was more um, defining than just aesthetic. Yeah, like it was it was definitely the aesthetic like hey, you're going to pick the subculture, it's going to kind of help you pick, you know, your eyes, your hair, your body and and cool. all of that, which I thought was cool, but everything else that you do in the game is both narrative and mechanical. Mm-hmm. And it's like the one part of the game that's like strictly, as far as I can tell, strictly narrative. I mean, I, I could be wrong and Mark could be like, no, no, it totally in actual play, like it comes up. But I've played the game once in a one shot and I don't remember it. I don't remember it coming up. So it's really the one piece like I would like to see is like your subculture gives you uh, like a move or or something. Maybe gives you like an edge or something that's based on that subculture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. Because, yeah, it does feel like, I don't want to say, like, tacked on isn't the right word. But it, it there's yeah. something that's like... Yeah, it's just the only piece that doesn't have a mechanical... And maybe it's because game. everything else fits so well together. You know, maybe it's because everything mm-hmm. else is really good that this one part being okay is, like, not good enough. <laughs> it was the one time that we all went off and kind of did our own thing. Mm-hmm. Like... Everything else during character creation, we were all kind of like, we had to keep talking to each other. Like, oh, you know, Kurosawa was, you know, was involved in the, you know, in the thing where I picked up Rage for Pilot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Flynn, you know, we wound up telling the story about Flynn's ego. But, like, then when we were like, okay, everybody go pick a subculture. Like, we all just kind of like went, you know, like everybody put their heads down. Yep. Right. Looked at the book. Yeah. Like, looked at the book and like filled everything out. And then, like, we just came back and told each other. But none of it linked together do you mm-hmm. think that's on purpose though because it it seems like a very individual thing when you're creating your character's literal identity in this game where you you create your look you create your chosen identity because i would imagine that most of the the neon characters didn't look that way from birth you know sure so cause at some point along the line you as a character chose to make your hair all floaty and glowy or your eyes all weird or or your skin all all sorts of weird patterns on it it seems like it it's the one thing where you have full control over because you because in the story, you would have. Yes, you, you would have chosen that path yourself instead of linking to other people. Sure. It's basically a self-identity sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. It is the one piece of character creation narrative that just doesn't necessarily mechanically... Like, my, yes. my choices don't mechanically affect how I play the game, right? I like what I chose. I like being like this glowy, crazy angel snakeskin mm-hmm. creature. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love it. And as a character and as a player, I'm going to take the opportunity to describe some of that cool stuff. So it becomes oh, yeah. maybe a little bit setting reinforcing because mm-hmm. I'm excited about the choices that I made. But in and of itself, I could have picked anything. It wouldn't really matter. Right. Yeah, it definitely wouldn't matter rules wise, at least. It, now, it would probably make a difference, and I and I think I've played it like this before, like if I'm trying to sneak into a corporation mm-hmm. and my hair is glowing, that might have a different effect than mm-hmm. if Flynn tries to sneak into a corporation and he looks like a corporate dude, Yeah, he's going to walk in more easily just through the front door than I am, right? Oh, definitely right. Yeah, but there's no. I mean, just to be yeah, but there's just to be hard yeah, no. just to be hard about this. There's no <laughs> there's mechanical no, there's penalty no actual for that. Mechanical right, right. stuff written in, right? That's totally. And, and in fact, you're you're so hyper competent that if you are the one who has stealth, yeah, you should. You're just going to do it anyway. You're in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if you're the one who doesn't, then you're actually going to make you're going to make the roll to see if you know you can use the skill effectively. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think so. Powered by the Apocalypse games have a long history of including things to circle for different looks yes. like what kind of eyes you have what kind of build you have what kind of hair you have and and this certainly follows suit with that so it, it does the same thing it's just it's really interesting and i think it's because in other games lots of other components don't connect to other characters right. but but in this game it's the only one. so much connects <laughs> yeah. that it, it, you literally can feel the one piece that in a regular mm-hmm. game you wouldn't think twice about it but here it feels like the one piece that isn't connected to anything. Right, because in Dungeon World, I don't think about it. But in Dungeon World, <laughs> yeah, Dungeon- in Dungeon World, I sit down and I go, okay, here's some numbers. I'm going to circle, 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 yep. circle, circle. Okay, let's talk about relationships, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
exactly. Like, I'm going to make a whole bunch of choices. I'm going to pick these looks. Okay, give them, I'm going to pick a name off the name list. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, good to go. It's interesting because that kind of reinforces the idea that you are connected through this weird cybernetic completely throughout the entire game. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that the mechanics of character creation, for the most part, 99% of it is connecting with the other players. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which was great, yeah. right? It's what it's actually what makes character creation so much fun in this game is that connectiveness because it isn't just sitting there like, okay, I'm going to make a bunch of choices. You're making a bunch of choices. Mm -hmm. We'll all tell each, about, each other about our choices when we're done. Right. It's literally like I'm making a choice and it's going to involve a story about your character. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse, you usually sit down and you go, okay, I am the barbarian, so I want my strength to be my highest stat, and I'm going to put, you know, my next one in my agility or whatever. It, like, you, you just, you know, you're just d -d 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 numbers, numbers, numbers. Yeah, I'm going to pick my, I'm going to pick my hungers. Right. right. Like, I'm going to pick my hungers, and when we get to bonds, now we're going to do our thing where we link up. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say, because even in masks, you know, there were, there were a couple choices that we made collaboratively because we were sitting around it was like oh yeah it would be cool if i did this thing that went with your thing yeah but really yeah until you get to those questions at the end there's nothing that says anybody has to have any say in yeah what you're doing mm -hmm. whereas this one it, from step one was very clear that this is a group effort mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We keep saying that like it's a session zero, but it almost is session one of a game. Like you, you've already started yeah. playing. You have this. Yeah. You are creating the story as you're sitting there. It's not mm -hmm. a separate thing. And it absolutely can. I mean, it can be even more. It can be even more session one. There's an option in the book to play, and I think this is the way Senda f first played it on. She's a super yeah. geek where the characters who died just died. Yeah. 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 Like you're in the middle of that op. It's not like like for us, Washington died some point in the recent past and we're like collecting ourselves, you know, for the next strike. But the other way that you can run this, which is like the real session one, is that by the time you finish making characters, it's like, well, the helicopter went down and Washington's dead. Yeah. And you're still in the wreckage. Yeah. Go. Go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is a fun way to do it for one shots. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But I, I, but yeah, I mean, it, it just goes to show that like character creation does a really, really good job in this game of setting those expectations of like, here's what this game is going to look like because ha, uh, joke's on you. We've already been playing it this whole time. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that uh, actually uh, we keep doing this uh, goes into our next question of how does the character creation set our expectations for playing the game? And like we said, it we're literally playing the game while we create the characters yeah because you you can take this story that you created if it i mean if it all connects up it isn't a requirement of the character creation process mm -hmm. that everything should end up connecting to each other but when you have me in the mix it usually does <laughs> because i just love it because it makes the stakes for that intro point so high and yeah. i love that i would rather like everything just be interconnected and it just be this giant disaster because that's way more interesting to me oh yeah yeah i mean i'm the kind of like garbage player that's like who how about some inner party conflict that would be fun right <laughs> you know I, I mean and not because i want to like pick fights with people but because i think those are really cool stories to tell and have a lot higher stakes and are a lot more personally interesting to people that like i care way more about the relationship between my character and senda's character than i do about my character and random npc number four like that's mm -hmm. it's just and there's so much more to continue to play out there. Yep. That's my favorite. I feel like we're talking about a bunch of things that I've written articles about. I'm just going to say that because every time <laughs> I say, I wrote an article about, on Gnome Stew about this, and then it cracks me up because I used to mock Phil for saying that all the time. So I'm <laughs> just going to go ahead and insert that here. So just look up this episode on Gnome Stew. <laughs> just like type in the transcript into the search bar. Right. <laughs> well, it's like the last... <laughs> I'm sorry, I will stop having this conversation, but it's like my last article was about having secrets in game. My article before that was about relationships in game. The article before that was about hard decisions, and the article before that was about feels. So, just so saying. we've just covered your whole backlog then. A lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All Pretty much no, for 2018, yeah. <laughs> we mentioned a little bit when we talked about the look, but do you guys think, what do you think is the biggest flaw of character creation in this system because we said you know that look kind of just 
doesn't quite fit as well as some of the other things. Are there other things about this that you don't love? I, I didn't even I didn't even dislike the subculture. I thought I mean I thought the subcultures were fine and I thought they were they made sense to the setting. It's just it literally had just that one critique of not being connected to anything mechanical. It's but not that I don't like I this think... thing. I just want more of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe the one flaw to the character creation for this game is that everyone has to be there on day one. Yeah. Like I don't know and I don't recall if there's a thing in the book like what happens if somebody joins the game five sessions in like oh yeah yeah it's like, huh. right like can can you connect somebody to the headspace implant afterwards and how does that affect everybody's skills and what if they you know play the character that's dead like the character playbook that's dead like you know yeah. I don't know how you would do that because it was like you could say that they come back from the dead, but then like they would need all of their skills, not just the one. Well, and... what if you just went and got like, you know, what if you just went and got another infiltrator? Right? Yeah. Like, well, we well, we lost Razor, but here's another infiltrator we hired. I, I don't I don't think you do that. So I think that if there's a flaw to this game and I I'm careful to not say flaw because I think it's probably more of a de design conceit, but it's. You don't add anyone into this game. Mm -hmm. Like everybody shows up on day one. Anyone can die and leave. There's there's a way to deal with that. If anyone wants to drop out of the game once the game's played, um, you would just treat it like a dead character, right? You would claim um, which skill you wanted to keep in the headspace and say goodbye to them. But like if you're playing it and somebody's like, oh, my God, can I start, you know, can I play with you guys? You'd be like, uh, uh no. <laughs> no, you got to trade them out one for one. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's I, I think that might be the I think that might be like the real uh, challenges like you all and, and you have to be there. You can't like you can't make characters separately. No, right. like that's the other. There's no option to make characters separately. You must be present. It's definitely not a fast character creation process for a Powered by the Apocalypse game. But the reason that it's not fast is also the reason that I love it. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a flaw that it's not fast. But it's something that, you know, if you know, like, okay, I'm going to go run this as a one shot at, at a convention where you know you have a very limited amount of time, you know, really, what, three and a half hours, honestly, if we take right. it into consideration. Yeah, especially if you're playing with people who haven't done it before. Yeah, they've never mm -hmm. done it before and stuff. Your character creation process is going to take at least an hour and a half. So you have to take that into heavy consideration when you plan for this game as a one shot. And it's not, I wouldn't even call it a problem, but it's just like, it's, it's different from a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse where it's like, sit down, make a character five minutes. Okay, let's play. Right. right. You're, you're not going to get a lot of, um, in a one shot, you're not going to get a lot of actual table play. Exactly. Like you're going to, half your session is going to be character yep. and then you guys are going to do something. Yeah. One like, thing. It, you're actually, yeah, <laughs> you're going to do like, you're going to have like one small mission. I I think the other thing that might actually be challenging to this game is I don't know if pre gens will work. Uh, I feel like oh, they would yeah. not. It's not as much fun. I've done like, it. You could, but you would have to give everybody then like a pretty solid rundown of what the situation yeah. is to be able to yeah. effectively play those characters. And you also wouldn't have the emotional connection. Yeah, which as you is would. Right. the really fantastic thing that happens in character yeah. creation. Yeah. Now. Having said that, I I do think, like, I'm not actually beating on Headspace for having a long character creation time frame. Right. Because it is lots of fun to do, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah, it's long, but it's not it's tedious. It's not tedious. By any it means. Is, but it is a thing that as a GM, you have to know about so that you're not like, I'm going to plan this whole heist thing where they're going to do all of this crazy stuff. And then you sit down at the table thinking, well, this is powered by the apocalypse. It'll take five minutes to make characters. And then it takes an right. hour and a half, Right. Right. Said that I've actually played Headspace in a one shot with Mark. Yeah, I have a couple times. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, like you, you know, half half the session or more is making characters, and then you have like a little bit of a like you do a little bit of a mission. It actually would be better in a long con situation where you have three sessions in a in a con three linked sessions in a convention because yeah. Oh, yeah. this game benefits from having a little time uh, and space to breathe. And so having a character creation session and then following it like the end of that first session with an in media res opening, you know, like a getaway or something would be great. And then your second game is like a full on mission and your third one is a full on mission that's going to like, you know, close out some clocks like 
that's probably the ideal that's probably the ideal way to run headspace at a convention yeah i would agree i can't wait to play this as a, as a campaign <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen one of these days eventually it's no i mean i i think that those are all really valid points and i think i think you're right that they're not necessarily flaws they're just they are limitations right they yeah. are they're just yeah. things to keep in mind that that definitely separate this game from other games and depending on what you want out of a game may or may not be for you right mm -hmm. it's just stuff to kind of be aware of mm -hmm. all right so let's dig into the the different character types uh, a little bit and one of the things we'd like to do is see how balanced the different uh, characters are um, and are there any that like are stand out above the others? It's funny because in most other games, like this is like I, in most of the games, I think this question works like this question works yeah. great. The, the really crazy part in this game is that we all share each other's yeah, skills. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the answer is like, no, I mean, it, there are certainly ones that like maybe would be better to have all of the skills of or something like you may say mm -hmm. that. This is, we definitely need this one, but. It, it would probably depend entirely on the actual situation that you found yourselves in as a character. Yeah, um, right. Just looking at it as like, it's a cyberpunk game. And I've played a lot of these characters and I've run a lot of these characters, like all of them, I think, have at least been in a game that I've been running. I have mm -hmm. not noticed any sort of power differential that like one person is more useful than other people. Right basically like the the ghosts that you have on your team if you've got two missing characters it, it kind of makes it a lot harder to figure out what's that one skill that you want to bring over because if you had a full party you're only missing two skills well now you're missing four and that gets a little bit more wishy-washy on what you want to keep so mm -hmm. I will say in my experience, um, what tends to happen, and this is true not just of this game, but like of many, many, many games, right? Which is that if you have a sword, then everything becomes a thing that you can hack at. So like the game, the first time I played this with Mark, the one skill that we kept was parkour. And we used parkour for everything. <laughs> we found a way to make parkour be the skill that made sense in every situation, right? Yeah. So I think that the skills are loose enough to allow you wiggle room to mm -hmm. use them creatively without being so loose that you're stepping on each other's spotlights in terms of the ones that you can just do as a professional, right? Mm -hmm. So I think he actually walks a very good line on that. But I think in walking that line, I also just, I don't, I don't think that there's any particular playbook that it's like, well, you have to have this one or you can't play the game, right? Right. Yeah. I think it's a sign of how well designed this is, though, that like this is a question that we that we talk about a lot um, and comes up in a lot of other games that we're sitting here going, well, I don't really think it's an issue this time. Exactly. Yeah. That, you know, this game is, it, it's really tight. Like it's, everything fits together very, very well. And I, I think you're right. The, the fact that you can use other skills and things like that, it just makes balance kind of a non-issue at that point. It's much more how you use things and when you use them. And then really just like your own personal comfort with the character that you're playing mm -hmm. rather than it being a balance issue. It seems like it's much more about just how well you play that character, I guess. Right. And I mean, there's also, there's, there's basically rewards for functioning as a team, you know, in terms of um, what he calls sync, which is like special stuff that happens when you roll, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, right. But so like, there's a lot of rewards for essentially functioning as a unit, even when you're using someone else's skills. Right. Mm -hmm. And that comes through both mechanically and in in terms of role play at the table, even when it's a situation like, you know, Angel doesn't trust Flynn, like it's still going to come across as like not trusting you, but on a team, like we're still a team. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the mechanics kind of enforce that, too. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's it plays really well. I don't think that I don't think that there's a problem with any character being super unbalanced. No. Definitely. One thing that we haven't actually covered at all, I'm surprised because we've covered most of these questions already is how you go about creating npcs in this game there are some games that have kind of some setup for you that you can kind of find in the back of the book there are some games that give you no rules at all and expect you to just make player characters for your npcs how does this game handle that yeah it's it's pretty simple actually like the npcs as if i recall 
are actually just put together with just a few with a few things like they're usually they're based off of one of the operator types. So they have whatever operator skills go with that, with the operator and then uh, a dominant emotion and a couple characteristics. Mm. Like they're really, and, and that's actually, I think pretty indicative of PBTA games in general. PBTA characters tend to be a lot thinner built. They're not built the exact same way that they're not built the same way that characters are built yeah. and they often don't, and they often don't need to be just because of the way the GM moves work and things like that. Like the GM's not actually rolling to hit you. Mm -hmm. So they don't need, you know, like, it, like, you know, with a D and D NPC, it needs to have the same comparable stats because NPCs use the same combat system as players use, but empowered by the apocalypse GM moves are based off of, you know, six minuses and things like that. And so you don't roll, like you just need to know, like, what do they do? What narrative function do they perform and mm -hmm. basically how much staying power do they have, you know, in a scene before they're taken out? Right. So. And it seems like so much of this game, the things that we filled out on our character sheet were specific to our party. Whereas when you have an NPC, you don't have to build those backstories. So you don't really need any of that information. Everybody really only has those three stats. Mm -hmm. So. It, that would make it a lot easier to just kind of fill in those boxes if you don't have to answer all of those questions, too. Like, that was what mm -hmm. the majority of our time was spent on. There are some mm -hmm. in the back of the book, um, because what, what Mark did is he basically created a, a major NPC related to each of the corporations. And I know it's oh. true of his new setting book that's coming out as well. There is basically, like, a key player, if you're going to run into a big bad boss kind of person, basically, for x corporation like those ones are those people are kind of created for you but again it's mostly just kind of a quick like it's a paragraph about their backstory and what they do and like how they function in the world more than anything then let's go ahead and talk about this group's uh, our group's cohesion basically uh -huh. <laughs> how, how does our group gel together and would we work well on the typical missions that you would go through in a typical game you know Oh yeah. I mean I I mean I, I mean I think that's part of the conceit yep. of the game, right? Is like you you have to work well together. The character creation certainly gels everybody. Like that is I think a thing that everybody comes out with, but also at the same time you also have a big secret. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yep. So you actually can disrupt the cohesion of the group depending on what your big secret was. And some of those questions, if you remember, are pointed at other characters mm -hmm. like what was it? Flynn had a question about whose family did he put under surveillance, yeah. right. you know, for a corporation like those are great. The game starts so harmonious because you all agreed, right? The conceit of this game is like you all got this headspace implant yeah. to be like the ultimate team. And then yet at the same time, like your troubled backgrounds have these like landmines mm -hmm. in it that, you know, can cause these temporary disruptions. Yep, We really had some some pretty serious inner party conflict like the couple of the things that we laid out i mean and it seems like there's no way to really not have that in this game but the few that we laid out we were we were not gentle about them <laughs> no and we shouldn't be because the thing is like really when it comes right down to it once you got that link in your head the implant like it's not coming out right no. so you made this decision and you kind of made this bed you're going to sleep in it with these people whether you like them or not mm -hmm. and that's part of the conceit of the game too so like there's no like eh, i don't like you guys i'm not going to work with you anymore like even if you made that decision they would still be in your head <laughs> right yeah yeah so like that's a thing this felt to me like a pretty i mean it was good i, I haven't had a bad character creation session for this game right mm -hmm. but this is totally a game that i would pick up and run or play oh, yeah. and it, it would be great right so I, I think that this is pretty typical for this system and i think that it would play out very nicely in this system also mm -hmm. now one thing uh, i remember during our character creation we we all talked about our regrets as mm -hmm. we were creating the characters but in the actual game you keep those private right yeah you do because it, it's actually a mechanical thing when you choose when you choose to reveal that. So yeah. the way that the regrets work is if you roll a six minus, which is bad, <laughs> if it is something that, and, and this is one of those cool things because I love hard decisions like this in games. Yeah. So it's one of those things where I get to decide as a character when I roll that six minus, am I taking that six minus 
or do I reveal my regret to the rest of the party, Mm -hmm. right? If I reveal my regret, then I act as if the dice rolled a 10, which is like gets you your best stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, to do that, I would have to... I would have to tell you the story, like the vignette of me creating and realizing what I had just created in this disease. And then you would all know I'm the person who had created this disease that is killing hundreds of thousands of people. And that would be just a huge bomb in the middle of a session. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Oh. (laughs) So So the idea behind that is that that should be an emotionally difficult choice. And it's something that you shouldn't do unless you really care about getting the Mm -hmm. 10 in that situation but the other thing that revealing a regret does is i mentioned sync earlier it also gains sync for the entire group so because you now actually know each other a little bit better um you gain this token that's it's it's like sync you get sync (laughs) like you're more (laughs) in sync with each other and the way that sync works you can you can use it a couple of different ways and let's i don't know if i remember all of them so when as a group, as a cell, you gain sync, you all also get an experience point. So when we get to talking about advancement, like that's how you get experience points is by working closely enough together that you gain sync. So again, as a team, mechanically, you're being rewarded for it. And then once you have sync, you can spend it by any any player can spend it at any time to roll a 10, to just roll it. Awesome. And also, I guess then means that sort of prevents people like Senda and I from just derailing the game and making it constant inner party conflict, (laughs) which I mean is, is kind of tempting. And there are, you know, like you also have the, you're working against the clock on things too. So that there, there are story beats that you kind of have to hit and things Mm -hmm. like that. But I like that it, it does kind of require you to, to get like, there's a mechanic that says you have to work together after we've gone through this character creation that says, here's why you're at odds. There's this, incentive to kind of reel that back in a little bit right yeah. I'm, i mean i think it it sets up really good inner party conflict but um it's definitely not the purpose of the game to spend all of your time focused on that and i think that a large driving function of the setting and and all of the different settings is that there are pressing reasons that you have to work together right Like, there's this disease, and there were these earthquakes, and there's all of this really terrible stuff going on. And so even if I don't like Flynn because I don't trust him as far as I could, like, push him, I have to work with him because... And and then here's the secondary part, right? Firstly, I have to work with him because I have to cure this disease. Mm -hmm. Secondly, like, then you get into the part that's secret to me until it's revealed in play... Secondly, like, I need to redeem myself because I created this disease, so I am willing to work with whoever I need to work with, even if I hate their guts. Yeah. Right. So it sets you up into a a situation where you have very strong reasons to work together, even if you don't like each other. (laughs) (laughs) So in the system as a whole, what do you think about kind of how it plays out and how that lends to character development? not character advancement, but like, how do, how does the game work? And like, how do the mechanics work for a character to kind of grow as a person over time? Because you still do have these conflicts and these, you know, like you can share some of that information, but like, how do you kind of overcome some of those obstacles? Well, so I mean, I think first off, you're, you're rewarded mechanically for making that difficult choice of revealing your regret. And that is definitely a, a an emotional character development moment. That doesn't mean you no longer have one. It means that you get to create a new one. So now I get to say, oh, there's something else that I did that I'm also working for either revenge or redemption, right? So mm-hmm. it means that the, the the depth of the terrible things that you did <laughs> keeps going. <laughs> but that's definitely a way that it continues to develop the character as an individual. I mean, I think it gives you a lot of space with how you play out the relationship of the characters between themselves. But I don't think it does as much with that mechanically. Oh, okay. You know, I think this game loads itself up with with stories and, you know, launches characters with potential sticking points with each other. And so character development over the course of the game is going to be as those things kind of emerge and play out and the stories that kind of get told. I mean, a good GM a good GM is going to call back on a whole bunch of those things, right? A good GM is going to, is going to bring up this fact that this player's family is being, family's being watched by drones. And, you know, Flynn's going to remember 
like, oh, I'm the one who set up that surveillance network. I can help take it down. And yay, Flynn can help take it down. But why, Flynn? Like, you know, why were you the one who set it up? You know, like, like those things are going to those things are going to totally happen throughout the game. And it's really it's part on the players and it's part on the GM to really mine all of those uh, connections and make sure that they they are parts of the uh, the game going forward. All right. Uh, then let's go ahead and get into our character advancement segment and take it up level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. In this segment, we talk about how character advancement or leveling up works in this system. I know we've we've talked a lot about running this as a one shot, but you can play it as a campaign. So if you do play this game over a longer period of time, how does a character level up and what kind of uh, what kind of perks and things do you get when that happens? Operator advancements uh, pretty straightforward. Whenever operators gain sync, everybody gets an experience point. And then uh, between sessions, you can spend your XP. Actually, they say anytime. So at any time, you can spend your XP to purchase additional edges and upgrades or to increase a discipline by plus one. So edges cost you, uh, edges are easy. They cost you three experience points. Upgrades cost you six. And adding one to uh, any discipline is nine XP per plus one. Oh. So really straightforward, but very dependent on getting sync. Yep, which means you have to be working together as a team. <laughs> so, so you share XP in this game then? You each get your own XP, but you all yeah. get it for the same. The, the trigger for everybody receiving XP yeah, yeah. is the same, right? Okay. So everybody always gets XP at the same time. Very so you're interesting. Always right. going to... You're going to spend it the way you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. I could spend my three and you could be saving up for your six. Mm -hmm. But we're all always going to be functioning having had the same number of experience points because we always gain them as a group. Well, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, other than revealing that secret, how what are what are the other ways that you you can get that sync? It's or if you make a sacrifice for another person's drive. So so like somebody's ha somebody's regret has to be revealed already for you to do it this way. If um, Kirasana knows that my regret is that um, I created the disease and so my drive is redemption and you take action in a in a very clear way to help me on my path to redemption that gains us sync as a group. Oh. Okay. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I like it. So somebody has to be the first one to break. Yeah. You have to mm -hmm. hit a really complicated <laughs> situation in which someone reveals their regret and then I mean and then if they're the only person who's revealed their regret then it means that everybody else can get the party sync by all helping that person <laughs> with their drive, right? So is there a definitive end point to this game then? When you fulfill everybody's... Uh... No, because you said you make a new yeah, one, right? Make a new regret. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're... I mean, if you're looking for what the like the campaign arc is like that is all of the clocks right that's all the corporate clocks so you know if you're looking for the break point like hey when do we you know wrap this game it's when you set up the campaign you're setting up the clocks and the corporate plan and so if the if the players are able to win that is you know thwart the corporation from completing those clocks like that's probably going to lead you to a satisfying conclusion right. it, it almost seems though if if you keep adding regrets you just had these immensely flawed characters who have had an amazing amount of regrets in their past that gets revealed you know slowly over time throughout play Right. I, th I mean, I think part of the understanding is that like your characters before the headspace implant worked for the corporations and were, Terrible. you know, Terrible. bad people. people like they've got plenty of skeletons in their closets. They've participated in all sorts of black ops and, you know, even yeah. before the disaster, like they've done all sorts of terrible things. And so, yeah, like your, you know, your first round of regrets are probably going to be around the around the immediate problem but your next set mm -hmm. you know are probably going to be more about your character right like if uh, charger's immediate concern is that he drove the contagion into the neighborhood his next one might not have anything to do with the disaster at all and it might be you know a, you know smart character would link it immediately to like another mm -hmm. npc or something 
And and then that would be, you know, a great drive to start having that NPC be in the game or the after effects of the NPC or whatever. You definitely get the feeling that it's not the kind of game that you're supposed to... You hear people saying, like, oh, we've been playing the same D&D campaign for 25 years or whatever. Like, this is clearly not that kind of game, just because you you would get to a point where, like, your character is too terrible of a person <laughs> then if you keep adding regrets. Like, well, at some point, that backstory is going to become kind of unplayable. And the clocks sort of prevent that, too, to a degree. There's another thing about Powered by the Apocalypse games in general, which is that they don't level up to eternity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's just not mm -hmm. how Powered by the Apocalypse works. There is a defined amount of stuff you can get. And then once right. you have gotten all of that stuff... There isn't anything more to get. Like, you can keep playing, but your characters will kind of stop advancing. Yeah. This game doesn't, like, specifically cut that off in the way that some of the other ones do. But, like, it still can happen. If you did play this game for two years, everyone would just have everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of other Power by the Apocalypse games actually have, you know, a final advancement that actually advances yeah. you out of the game. Mm-hmm. But this one doesn't. This one doesn't. I think that the signal for the end of the game is the initial yeah. corporate clocks. There's something to be said for just saying, like, this is the story we've told and it's good now. Sometimes the end isn't like when you reach the final advancement point. It's when you say, like, OK, this is a good point to wrap up mm -hmm. our story because it just has that good, mm -hmm. like, narrative closure, too. And that's also totally fine. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions that we had for this discussion portion. So, yeah, thank you cool. both so much for joining us to talk about Headspace. Absolutely. Ed, Senda, you want to remind everybody where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter. It's unspellable, but I'm going to spell it anyway. It's I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D, Idella Mifflin. You can also find me on She's a Super Geek, which is one of my podcasts, and Pandas Talking Games, which I do with Phil, which is my other podcast. Both of those are also on Twitter, so they're easier to find than me specifically. <laughs> and they're also on Facebook and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can find Love and Justice, which is my first game. It is a magical girl's hack of lasers and feelings um, released through Encoded Designs. And that is currently on Drive-Thru RPG. And it's free, so you should go download it, right? Everybody should go download it. <laughs> and uh, and we're currently working on uh, on Turning Point. That's where I'm supposed to be spending most of my time. I'll keep an ear out for it. Hopefully there will be more information floating around by the time this episode actually drops. And Phil, what about you? Where can people find you? What are you working on? Primarily, you can find me on Twitter at DNA Phil. You can find me on my two podcasts, so Pandas Talk Games. And uh, you can find me on The Misdirected Mark, which uh, streams live Tuesday evenings at 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 6.45 p.m. the Queen's Time. So you can find that on Twitch, you can catch it live, or you can just pick it up uh, wherever you normally get your podcasts. Uh, as for me, i am always got something I'm working on. I'm uh, currently getting ready to publish the ash can of my uh, Hydra Hackers game. So I've been working on that for a few years, and that ash can is, it should be out late summer, early fall. Wonderful. Perfect. About the time that this episode <laughs> comes out. So look for Hydro Hackers Operatives. Well, thank you everyone again for sitting with us to do this. And thank you everybody out there for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix. Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. 
also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Oh, I had to have a conversation, just me and Rich, just going over stuff in the system that we were talking about because Jeff had to step out for uh, some sort of conference as well. Oh, so it must it, have been horrible for you to have to sit and talk to Rich Howard by yourself. I know, it was absolutely one. horrible. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, you know, good people. I, I lived the tough life. <laughs> one reminder before we start. Uh, we are explicitive free. Oh, show? we are not explicit. We have not been warned. Okay. <laughs> okay, hang on. <laughs> yeah, a like, well... That's a different gear for me. <laughs> Let's get it out now. What about innuendo? Is innuendo still okay? Like, <laughs> innuendos I may not... are fine. Okay. I was going to say, it might not be in the right place. beeps in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be going through and be like, I got to kind of erase this part. Right, all my, all my podcasts are naughty. That's <laughs> <laughs> naughty. Look, Ryan, you made it through our recording with Emily. I think you'll be okay with this one. That's true. I'm used to one hour, one and a half hour. Like that's my. I know normal... Chris doesn't even edit. Yeah, Chris doesn't like... even edit. Like that was the that was that's how I got him to agree to keep going through the oh. show. When he... <laughs> I know. I still edit. And our show is much shorter, but I think I edit for our, longer. Our show requires our show requires editing, <laughs> especially when you're talking about the beefness. <laughs> Apparently, yep. Senda's lexicon is a new segment on the show now. Ditch <laughs> lilies and Senda's lexicon. Senda's word of the day. Yeah, smurge. As I recall, we did. The, and it was an early episode about um, doing crossovers, and you really enjoyed smoosh too, or something. Smooshed. Oh yeah, smooshed. Yeah. I think it was smooshed. I think it was smooshed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember. I've been to all those episodes so many <laughs> I know. Times. And then you listen to all the outtakes, like, straight. It was, like, 12 <laughs> hours already at that point. It's a lot of bonus I've outtakes. I've done the math. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan has like a real podcast problem because I feel like people come on our show and I'm like, I have the standard podcaster greeting of I've heard really great things about your show, but I haven't had time to listen to it. Right. Which is. And what Ryan usually is like, oh, I binged all the episodes like last week <laughs> and, you know, like all 254 yesterday. I'm like, there's not even that many hours in a day and I don't know how you did it. I don't know either. I don't know how he does it. I don't He's have like time. in the shower with his earbuds in, I'm sure. No, I like, just probably. have it playing in the shower. Oh, okay, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got the logistics of it wrong, but not the facts. <laughs> right, the actuality. But still, that's the only, like, shower. I don't know. Do you listen I... to it on normal speed, or do you speed it up? Um, Usually between 1.2 and 1.7 speed. 1.7? So <laughs> I'm going specific, through one shot right now too. at 1.7 speed. Otherwise, I'll die trying to catch up. But um, I, I listen to the All Out of Bubblegum uh one shot oh. episodes on 1.7 speed yeah oh <laughs> my god Ugh. why do we have a separate folder like why don't we just put the game in with the episode notes this is stupid. one is for games one's for episode notes <laughs> i know but it would make sense for all of like if have a folder for each game not for each <sighs> you're making too much sense i'm just gonna see you like I'm a professional reading it with your lips Professional. Professional. Oh, I'm so happy that I have that on here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, here, here, let me do you another favor. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Bloop. <laughs> Bloop. Every time a text comes through on Ryan's phone, that's the sound it's going to make. Now. <laughs> <laughs> then I will know that he's a true super fan, fan of stuck in games. <laughs> Oh my god. Was gosh. there ever like a doubt for a second whether no. he was or not? He's been like geeking out about this for like two weeks now. <laughs> He's like, I don't know how I'm gonna make it. Come on now. It's fine. It's been longer than that. He doesn't like, deny it. He's like, no, I've been geeking out for way longer. Oh, uh, this episode's gonna be a hundred percent outtake. <laughs> uh story of my life. <laughs> As long as you don't separate the marshmallows out from the kibble, you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> Love that you call it kibble. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It if you exactly took if you took like. if you took the marshmallows away and put it in a bowl and put it on yes. on your floor, you would yeah. think like your cat would come over and eat it.
<sighs> okay, okay. So on that note, <laughs> so, <laughs> should we what? So should I try sh- this? Maybe it's a show, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys it. do it. You guys do it. We'll we'll hang mm-hmm. back. Bloop. Yeah, would recommend Canada. <laughs> for someone who doesn't this eat podcast beef, podcast now sponsored by Canada. <laughs> I know, right? Like for someone who doesn't eat beef, here is like my weirdest like Canadian story that I was like shocked and amazed by, right? <laughs> And then I promise we can go back to talking about Headspace. So we're staying at like a Holiday Inn Express or something. Like not just like a normal old like, you know, whatever. It's fine. Like we have those in America too. Right. It's just like a normal little hotel. It's like not schmancy or anything. It's just, you know, it's a hotel, right? And we come downstairs for breakfast. I don't eat beef. Like <laughs> we've already covered this. And 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 we roll up to the breakfast thing and they have bacon and turkey sausage and i was like are you you kidding me this is amazing i never want to go home (laughs) like because i never like nobody ever has turkey sausage anywhere ever like if i want sausage i take it home and i make it because it's delicious like Mm -hmm. turkey sausage is delicious but it's the best type of sausage well, I'm glad that you agree. <laughs> I also it doesn't don't have eat all beef. that beefness. Exactly. I am not a fan of the beefness. Well, good. I'm glad we're both on the same page here. <laughs> so turkey sausage. So I sat down at like just a a hotel like free breakfast with the room and they had turkey sausage. And I was like, my mind was blown. And you were like, thanks, Justin Trudeau. You're doing good work. Yeah, I was like, you're doing good work here. Hug more pandas. I agree with that, too. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Back to the game. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I hope that this will be releasing right around the time that that releases. I mean, that'd be cool. I don't know when so his perfect. actual publication date is Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll keep an eye out for it so that we can leave the part in where we're like, <gasps> right. <laughs> where I'm like, I know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> I know things about people. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> I totally lost my train of thought and what I'm trying to say. Hold on, let me get to that page so that I can like see what I'm talking about here. No, you should sing a song because that's what goes in the outtake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask for a waveform song. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I usually work on those for like most of my time home nowadays. <laughs> and I don't just fall out of my head anymore. Or 30 seconds before the show. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> I just make up songs on the fly. I mean, okay. <laughs> is sucks right. okay? I, I just I think it's a really is good. Okay. Sucks is a perfectly acceptable word. <laughs> um, hang on, I'm gonna pause for one second because it sounds like it's raining into my house right oh. now, that's, and I can't tell. I'm like a little bit that's concerned. Concerning. You should go check. Yeah. That. I'm that's gonna okay. go make sure that like uh, my couch isn't soggy. That's right. okay. We're gonna we're gonna make outtakes while you're gone. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you finished that. We haven't with, done that already. I'm glad you finished that with takes. <laughs> yeah, soggy couch is yes, actually. Yes, we're gonna make out while you're gone <laughs> remotely from across the country. You guys have fun. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Soggy Couch is the Ditch Lily song where um she had the threesome on the couch that was all wet because it had been rained on. Right, because mm-hmm. it's outside in a field. Right, exactly. Yeah, that and was like the whole purpose. Yeah, like, that was yeah. the music video too. They just filmed yeah, and it. actually the cover of the album is yeah. the same thing. It's the just a couch thing. in just a field. Couch. Yeah, yeah. Beat up I, th- couch th- in I think I only field. heard the uh, the bootleg version of that, which was like ninety six kilobit per second MP three. Oh, was there a non bootleg version of that? I don't know. <laughs> it was yeah, that was the one that was on Napster. <laughs> right. Oh, <boy. laughs> That was on Napster. That's um, that was a thing. That's right. Did you hear the Napster episode yet, Ryan? I can't yes. remember what I've dropped. Okay, good. <laughs> oh lordy, good old Napster. Napster, it's a thing. <laughs> it was a thing. It was a thing. Wait, is, isn't it still technically a thing? Isn't there like a? I don't know. I think that's Napster? how you get viruses now. I think if you <laughs> like if you if you connect if you connect your machine to Napster, like you just it gets taken over as part of a botnet like, or something. Hey, look, we're quote unquote legit. Yeah, <laughs> download stuff from us. 
Uh, that was it was a beautiful time. It was a it was a innocent it was an innocent and heady time when uh, when we could just you know share each other's music and download it without any repercussions from the man. <laughs> Okay, I was correct. Oh dear. And my carpet is wet. What? Do you do you need to do something? Oh no, it just like it just started in like the last like five minutes or so. Okay. So it's fine. It just like it's really windy and like lightning and everything. So Oh my. Um yeah. But uh, it sucks because I wanna have my windows open because it seems like it's like ten degrees cooler outside now. Oh, oh well it probably but, is. Right, but also my couch is wet, so <laughs> soggy couch. Just soggy kidding. Couch. Just, just like it's just you know the what? curtains. Soggy <laughs> the couch. curtains are very wet. <laughs> yeah, it's a soggy couch. Definitely a ditch lily song. <laughs> soggy crouch, I'm not a grouch. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> the name of our new band, <laughs> Soggy Couch. <laughs> you guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil this for you because it's not out yet. But and you're probably not gonna listen anyway because you don't care. But <laughs> <laughs> we're friends. It's fine. I mean, don't um, set it up like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to flip back and forth in the book without making lots of page turning noises, so I keep turning the pages really I'm not slowly. Promise, I'm not promising I'm not making yeah, page right. turning noises. If, okay. if you're not Sorry, talking, Ryan. I'll just edit that out. That's okay. Okay. Page so... turning noises are nice, though. Those are yeah. like comforting and like. They are nice. Sometimes I leave them. <laughs> also, he said steaks. <laughs> I know. I was watching you, and I'm really proud of you for holding it together until he finished his sentence. Uh, I am professional. Did you see how I held it together I know, and got you're through that? Professional. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking notes. Nope, we're okay. all writing now. <laughs> okay. I couldn't see because I had to switch off of my video so that I could look at the book. Oh, that's right. I got paper. <gasps> you came prepared? <laughs> no, I didn't. I just had leftover paper and clipboard in here. <laughs> I like I tried to give you credit and you're like, no. <laughs> I'm a little too honest sometimes. I apologize. That's <laughs> Ryan, you are a gift. <laughs> I come from a Palladium background, though. <laughs> yeah, Phil knows what I'm talking about. You think you think this you think this character creation is going to take a while? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to pick your. I want you to pick the next twenty skills uh -huh. at twenty percent. And what education level are you? And oh, you get money now to spend. And oh, now you get to choose oh. between the one out of you know five hundred superpowers. Uh -huh. Oh my god! Oh, I've done. I think I've. Pl I think I've made a character in almost every Palladium system. So, yeah, same here. Yeah. Definitely. That was most of high school for yep. me. High school, uh, and most of college for me. Okay, so we go to the operator description in the playbook, chapter Ryan, six. Please. Is, is where all the stuff you're. I talking thought about I froze. Now. Yeah, I couldn't tell. There he's back. Yeah, okay. you're back. Oh, oh. you're Welcome back. back Ryan. We lost you for a minute. Was it me that was gone? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm just yeah. sitting here talking to nobody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the microphone knows what you said, so it's all good. I guess that's true. It's just gonna be like dead silence. It's like, okay, I guess nobody cares what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> Ryan, I care what you're saying. What do you say? I don't really remember, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the operator's chapter in the uh, in the the why can't I think of words? In the book. book. <laughs> Seriously. Wow. I'm looking at the PDF here and I'm like, what's that thing with paper in it? <laughs> oh my god. It's the future. I don't know. Seriously. I these books. Side note, we should write this dilemma. <laughs> we should write a cyberpunk dilemma about that. Okay, <laughs> write that down. Pulling out of the corporate, yeah. Okay, you guys carry on. I'll be in Trello here for a second. Nice. <laughs> All right, terrible people. My next digital question. high five. <laughs> uh, on three. No, you don't count, Ryan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just like you high fiving high, people. You can't do the high five if you won't be a garbage person. I can't person. not give a high five to one that's offered. Okay, sorry. That's. It wasn't offered to you, Ryan. You don't deserve it. Sad tears. You are not garbage enough. Yeah. Be more terrible. Be more terrible, damn it. Oh. He's got a chance. I've He's got a chance to redeem himself. To oh, yeah. Bloop. And we'll leave the, all this silence in for the, the actual show. Yeah, everybody loves, everybody loves silence. It's great. Bloop. I'm going to have to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know that you can change it. Yeah, but right? if I change it, it will disconnect. You, I've seen people do it, right? It yeah. disconnects every previous tweet that's ever been linked up to you mm-hmm. from your account. Since when? Because like I I changed mine at some well, point. Well, no, it, you changed the surface name, right? Not the not the act. Yeah, you can no, change the, the act, act. Oh, no. but it it disconnects it disconnects everything. Because I watched it happen to Cat Cool. I mean, I did it a couple. I did it a couple yeah. of years ago, but yeah. so I don't know. If it, it does. Did so I haven't changed it. Anyway, good. We're gonna pretend that none of that happened. <laughs> okay. Bloop. Hooray. Do you sing your outro? Now Hooray. I feel like this is where singing happens. Um da, 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 no da. I don't even I don't even know. We don't do a singing. Show me what you got. Do Show I just me what you got? Let's write a song. <laughs> do me. I just push the stop button at oh, random? Right. Do you, is is there like a thing? thing? Do you stop at the same time? Do you? It doesn't matter. No, you can no, just you stop can... whenever. We yeah, can, if, you, can stop. if you. Okay. But, just... Oh, but... gosh. Uh, oh, everybody uh, stopped. Everybody stopped, and I'm still going. Yeah, I haven't stopped yet. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Let me st- Bye. Bye. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit twitch.tv slash one shot RPG, where you'll find another great show, Total Party Kill. Total Party Kill is a weekly live Twitch stream where John Patrick Cohen, Eddie Klinker, and James Dugan play through Cephalofair Games' Gloomhaven. Join them in the stream to play along through the action and interact with constantly changing cast of characters and special guests. Or watch them after the fact on the OneShot YouTube channel.